All right, hello everybody. Um, we'll kick off. Um, my name is Ginny Barber. I'm the director of Open Access Australasia. Um, and we're, for those of you that don't know us, we're a membership organisation supported by uh, 20 universities across Australia and eight New Zealand universities. We also have as affiliates Creative Commons Australia and Toyota in New Zealand. So just some practicalities today. Um, we've had more than 180 people registered for this webinar, which is fantastic. So we've got some clearly a very high interest to this uh, region. We very much appreciate Kathleen, our speaker, doing this late in her day to accommodate the time zone, but I'm really pleased to note that uh, I think the level of interest indicates how much um, uh, uh, interest there is in this uh, topic uh, here. Uh, some practicalities, we will record the, web the webinar and post it on the website with the slides, so there's no need to uh, uh, kind of take massive nuts of notes. Um, please do keep your microphone muted. Uh, as usual, turn off your camera if you would not wouldn't mind, just for bandwidth for everybody. Um, type your questions into the chat. We'll keep that keep an eye on that, and we'll read out and respond at the end. And we will uh, finish on or just before the hour. I've put down at the bottom link to our website and also um, a Twitter account, Open Access ANZ, and we will be um, uh, tweeting throughout it. You're very welcome to uh, tweet as we go. So just uh, before we kick off with the formalities, uh, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of the traditional owners. This is NADOC week, as uh, many of you will know. Um, and this rather very beautiful poster, Care for Country, was designed by uh, Gubby Gubby artist, Maggie Jean Douglas, and I've uh, used that from the NADOC site. Um, I'm uh, in Southeast Queensland on the land of the Turrbal and Yugara people, who are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. Um, in UNS UNSW, which is the host institution of Open Access Australasia, uh, the Bedigal and the Gadigal lands of uh, the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and uh, pay my respect to any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are on this call today. So um, I'm really highly delighted that our, first, our speaker today is Kathleen Shearer, who's going to talk on cause vision for repositories in open science. Um, Kathleen has been the uh, executive director of CORE since 2013, and she's been working in the area of open access and open science uh, for over 15 years. Um, she's based in Canada um, and uh, participates in numerous um, open science uh, or, uh, initiatives around the world. Um, you can read about her activities on the CORE website, but I'd just really like to say that personally, she's been a huge inspiration for many in this field. Um, she not just for the consistent high quality of the work that she's led at CORE, but also the way that she's, uh, the leadership that she's shown, particularly um, in the way that she's fostered collaboration around the world in what is a very challenging environment, as we know. So I will hand over to Kathleen, who will share her slides, and then we'll uh, get together at the end to um, answer some questions. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, let me just get my slides up here. Yeah, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, good morning to you all and good evening from, from Montreal, Canada. Um, what I want to talk about today really is the way CORE is, is viewing repositories as increasingly important and critical infrastructure for ensuring inclusivity and equitability in, in scholarly communications. Um, maybe just a few brief um, comments about the organization. We're, um, we're actually an international organization with about 150 members and partners from around the world. Uh, we have four Australian members you see here. Um, our office is based in, in Germany and Portugal, um, but we're a very small organization. In total staff, we have about 1.5 full-time employees. So we're a small organization, but I, I think we're a response, uh, very responsive and, and quite an effective organization as well. 
And um, the work that we do is really around advancing repositories globally. And, and we do that in, um, via a number of activities. Um, we do a lot of work around alignment and interoperability to make sure that repositories are not siloed, but repositories, uh, individual repositories and repository networks that are evolving in different countries and regions are interoperable and aligned. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on next generation repositories. So what are the new technologies that could be adopted in repository platforms? Um, bibliodiversity, which I'll talk about quite a bit in my talk today. Um, and also we see ourselves kind of as, as the global voice for the repository community. So we, we feel that we um, need to be very active in ensuring that the perspectives of repositories is at the table in um, international and national conversations. So um, as the executive director of, of CORE, it has been my really great privilege uh, before COVID-19 to travel around the world, to engage and learn about the context of um, issues related to scholarly communications in many different regions, countries, and communities. And, and I'd like to share some of the things I've learned with you today and also talk about what opportunities I see in terms of uh, repositories can present to, to address the problems and issues. Um, today, um, we are uh, more global than, and, than ever before and more interconnected. Uh, many of the challenges we face as um, an international community must be addressed at the global level. And of course, uh, climate change in particular comes to mind. Um, but of course, with COVID-19 pan um, pandemic has really brought this also to the forefront and made everyone extremely aware about the need for international collaboration in science and the need for sharing of research outputs. So if we didn't know before that we were all in this together, we, we, we sure do know it now. And um, as the head of WHO, Tedro Gebriasis says, you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will not be over anywhere until it's over everywhere. Um, but research is also very local and um, it's important that researchers are also able to work and address problems that are relevant potentially only in their own local environments. Um, and this local aspect of research, I think has been increasingly neglected um, because of the way that we've constructed the international research communication systems and research assessment frameworks that really drive um, researchers to publish in the high impact so-called international journals. But what I think we really want to achieve, what the ideal is, is that we have a scholarly communication system that supports the flow of knowledge internationally, but also enables local diverse um, research um, uh, projects to, to, to be able to thrive. So, um, you know, this, this type of diversity is really important, an important characteristic of a healthy ecosystem. And the word that we've been using to, to really um, characterize that is bibliodiversity. Um, and bibliodiversity, uh, you know, like any other type of ecosystem, um, needs diversity for, for it to be healthy. Um, the authors of this London School of Economics blog argue that um, diversity of academic content, both at the national level um, and international level, is essential for preserving research in a wide range of global and local topics, studied from different epistemic and methodological approaches, inspired by various schools of thought and expressed in a variety of languages. So it's, we're not just talking about a diversity of formats or models, for example, we're really talking about a diversity of ideas, a diversity of knowledge uh, systems and how we can nurture that. Um, and, and I think underlying that is that we need to support new models 
diverse models and diverse formats to be able to really support those diversity, di diversity of ideas. Um, so the term uh, bibliodiversity was first coined actually uh, by a group of Chilean um, book publishers, um, but it has more recently been taken up by a, a group of French organization that published the Jezia call to, uh, for open science and bibliodiversity in 2017. <clears throat> and they published this call because they were, they were quite worried about the, the transition from subscriptions to open access and that uh, the predominant eight article processing charge model for, um, for publishing research would um, uh, become the, the predominant model and the, they were quite worried about the impact of that on the diversity of, of smaller publishers. So um, last year, um, building on, on the Jezia call, CORE, uh, myself and several colleagues published um, a paper um, that discusses the kind of the current state of bibliodiversity and scholarly communication and um, put out kind of a call for action to identify specific activities that different stakeholders can take to address the decline in bibliodiversity. And the aim really here is, was to raise awareness of this issue and um, bring bibliodiversity up in terms of um, visibility because there's been kind of a singular focus on, on moving towards open access and open science, but bibliodiversity is also very a very important characteristic that we need to keep in mind. So um, what is the current state of bibliodiversity right now? Well, um, Unfortunately, it um, doesn't, it, um, you know, it can't really be said that it looks like a tropical rainforest at the moment. Um, as we know, rainforests are areas with extremely high biodiversity. So if we were to equate um, bibliodiversity with biodiversity, it more uh, accurately um, is represented by this um, deforested field in Madagascar actually far from promoting uh, diversity, the dominant ecosystem um, of scholarly publishing today increasingly resembles uh, what Vandana Shiva calls the monocultures of the mind. It's characterized by homo homogenization of public, publish, publication formats and venues, um, you know, that are increasingly owned uh, by a small number of um, multinational publishers who are more interested in profit maximization and the health of the system. And of course, this, this touches on researchers everywhere around the world, but I think it is most acutely felt by um, researchers in developing countries. Um, and you know, this is, this is really a, a systemic issue. It's, it's baked right into the system. So it doesn't matter how diverse, for example, the workflow <laughs> is at the large publishers like Elsevier or Wiley or Taylor and Francis. Um, this will probably not have an impact on um, the current state of bibliodiversity. It, it, we really need to make systemic changes to, to be able to support bibliodiversity. So in our paper, um, we talked about four um, highly interconnected factors that are contributing to the decline in bibliodiversity. Um, the predominance of the English language, um, the concentration of publishing services and infrastructures, limited funding models and research evaluation frameworks. And I'm just gonna take you briefly through, through each of these. And then I'm gonna, um, spend a little bit of time looking at how COVID-19 has kind of uh, changed, um, changed things a bit in the, in, the, in the current system. So the first factor is the predominance of the English language. Um, you know, many researchers around the world are um, obliged to publish in English, even if it is not their preferred or first language. And this brings up a number of problems. Um, firstly, uh, when researchers publish in English, uh, you know, the public and societies in those non-English speaking countries cannot access um, and use this research. 
Um, the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism in Scholarly Communications argues that the disqualification of local or national languages in academic publishing is the most important and often forgotten factor that prevents societies from using and taking advantage of research done where they live. Um, but it also introduces you know, significant biases in the system um, towards native English speakers because of course non-native English speakers will naturally have more difficulty articulating and explaining um, their research in English. And you know, people think and think differently in different languages. And so the constraints of the English language influence ideas and favor, you know, a certain epistemic worldview, kind of an Anglo-Saxon worldview. Um, actually, there are a lot of journals, um, people who've done research recently on, on, you know, looking at the journal landscape found that there are a lot of journals in, in other languages. Um, but the problem is that many of these journals are not indexed in the mainstream indexing services and citation databases. So they are essentially invisible when it comes to research evaluation. And therefore, researchers are very reluctant and discouraged from, from publishing in these venues. Um, so while um, the use of English, I think, as the lingua franca is very useful for um, international sharing of, of ideas and knowledge across the world. Um, we have seen that the emphasis on English is can also have quite a negative impact on um, bibliodiversity. Um, the second factor is the, the growing concentration of infrastructures and services in scholarly communications. And you know, bibliodiversity really requires a variety of open infrastructures and services around the globe, a network of community-driven infrastructures that can be localized and serve the needs of, of different communities. Um, but what we've been witnessing for decades now um, is mergers and acquisitions of the large publishing companies. And now it's even going beyond just the publishing companies to capturing the entire life cycle of scholarly communications. <clears throat> a colleague here from, from University of Montreal, actually Vincent Larivière did some research and in, in uh, 2015 um, and found that five of the major publishers controlled about 50% of the market and um, uh, up to 75% of the scholarly publishing market in some in some fields. So, um, and I, I think that is likely higher now, um, uh, given that we've seen um, more acquisitions over the last several years. I did a kind of quick Google search with the names of some of the large publishers followed by acquires. <laughs> and you can see, um, you know, Elsevier has over, you know, has been acquiring numerous companies over the last several years. Wiley uh, as well, acquiring companies, Taylor and Francis, and so on. So, um, uh, and, and you probably heard that um, recently um, ProQuest was also bought up by Clarivate. So this is continuing on. And it's really about, you know, who, who controls scholarly communications and are there functionality, are the services we have in scholarly communi communications, are there functionalities being developed based on the needs of communities or are they being developed really to drive revenues and profit margins of the large, large publishers? Um, and so this brings me to the third factor. Um, which is about the way um, scholarly publishing in particular, but scholarly communication more broadly is funded. Um, and we know there's a lot of money in the system. Um, Elsevier, for example, has annual profits of over a billion US dollars a year. Um, Claudio Aspesi, who is a longtime analyst in scholarly publishing values the academic journal market at about 10 to 11 billion US dollars. So it's quite substantial. And um, much of this money comes from, from us, from the libraries and from library consortia. 
um, and uh, often increasingly through um, big deal uh, pr purchases uh, uh, over multi-year licenses. Um, and these packages tend to kind of, you know, increase in size and cost at every new negotiation period. The publisher has more titles and uh, they're asking for, for more, um, more money to, to subscribe to, the, to, their, to their packages. And the result of this is that a greater portion of our budgets are going towards those small, those few small um, uh, numbers of large publishers. And this means that also the funds that we have left over to go towards the smaller, um, diverse, uh, community-based services are decreasing over time. And I think, um, you know, one of the worries that we have is that um, the predominant model for transitioning to open access through transformative agreements where um, the consortia uh, are negotiating open access agreements with, with the large publishers really will not see a decline and, you know, will not see us saving money and allowing us to direct more funding to smaller community-based services. Um, I like this tweet by Paul Aris at the University College London, who talks about transformative agreements with commercial publishers are like moving the deck chairs around on a sinking, around on a sinking ship. So again, um, the concern, and we're starting to see some evidence of this in early days as we, we do some analysis of the big deals, big uh, transformational agreement deals, is that actually more of our funds now are being directed towards, again, those, those large publishers. Um, so there have been a number of, you know, um, organizations and and uh, people who are involved in scholarly communication who have uh, expressed concern about this and in particular Latin America people in Latin America have been very vocal about this um, and of course because again they're concerned that the small amount of funding that they need to run their services um, uh, will uh, be no longer be available because it will be uh, all be going to the to the large publishers. So I think um, the last uh, factor it might be possibly the most important factor, um, uh, and that is of research assessment um, and our reliance really on journal articles and the major indexes in our research evaluation and ranking systems. And there's so much pressure on researchers around the world really to publish in high impact journals, journals that are usually based in, in the global north um, and journals that decide really what, researchers, what research is important and what research should be published. Um, if we look at, for example, the world university rankings, 30% of their assessment is based on uh, citations um, that come from the Scopus uh, database. So um, as uh, given, uh, you know, how sensitive uh, we know universities are in terms of their rankings, you can see how much pressure there is to publish in a journal that is indexed in Scopus. Um, even UNESCO, um, has, it, it, which is now supporting open science and talks a lot about bibliodiversity, is making the same mistake because they published their UNESCO science report 2021 just a few weeks ago. But the data that they're using to compare um, countries and their research outputs is based all on Scopus data. So again, this uh, means that uh, publishing in any journal that's outside of the Scopus database or um, you know, sharing research outputs that are not journal articles are essentially invisible in these research assessment and ranking systems. And so again, there's a huge disincentive um, or a huge incentive really to stick to those major international journals. 
just for your information, um, Scopus uh, only um, contains a small portion of the total um, uh, uh, journals from around the world. If you look at um, DOAJ, um, you know, probably 65% of the scholarly journals that are indexed in the Directory of Open Access Journals are not um, available through Scopus. And um, a recent, another recent study that was done looking at diamond journals, which are open access journals that don't charge um, article processing fees, found that only one third of those journals are even available in the directory of open access journals. So there's a whole ecosystem of journals out there that are essentially invisible to our research assessment systems. So, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I should also mention that this, what Scopus does contain is made predominantly English, English um, uh, journals as well. And some people have called this kind of a thinly veiled modern day kind of colonialism. Um, it forces researchers around the world to play the game as it is defined by the global north and by the large publishers who aren't own these journals and it it becomes really a vicious circle researchers must publish in high impact journals to be recognized therefore they publish in english in the so-called international journals that are visible in the major indexes and because of the demand those journals are able to to charge astronomical uh, prices for subscriptions or for APCs which in turn redirects funding away from smaller diverse infrastructures journals and platforms um, so uh, of course this vicious circle feeds right into the hands and the pockets of the the big commercial publishers so I guess this is more or less we were where we were at last spring when the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic began. Um, but I, I really think COVID-19 has changed things. Um, and although it's been just horrible and tragic uh, time for, for many of us, it I think it has also uh, on a positive note presented us with an opportunity to advance not only open access and open science, but uh, advance the principle of, of bibliodiversity. Jennifer Dudna, who's the winner uh, of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, um, uh, she was the, the person who, one of the people who developed the CRISPR technology um, has talked about three ways science has been impacted by COVID-19. One is greater public appreciation for science, greater scientific collaboration. And the third thing is better and faster science, uh, scientific communication. And um, I think she's right. Um, and I'd like to give you some, some examples or some evidence of that. Um, uh, first of all, we've seen a, a, a great increase in the sharing of, of preprints and data, um, unlike ever before. Um, I did a, a, a search of COVID-19 preprints and compare for 2020, comparing them with cancer um, uh, preprints at, in Euro uh, PubMed Central. And I mean, it was three times as many uh, preprints for COVID-19 related um, content. We've also seen a huge speed um, in uh, publication times from submission to publication. Uh, one study found that it was 10, on average, 10 days from sub submission to publication for COVID-19 articles compared to, they, they compared that with MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome articles, which was 72 days from submission to publication. So 10 days is, um, is unprecedented, I'd say, and anyone who's published an article knows that sometimes it takes, you know, over a year after you've submitted it for it to be finally to be published. And then of course, we've seen um, open access to all COVID-19 related publications. Um, this is a spreadsheet. Uh, the publishers were essentially co co coerced by governments to open up all their COVID-19 literature and, and they did so. 
Um, this is a spreadsheet that's maintained by ICOL, which is the International Coalition of Library Consortia. And they were tracking 100 different um, publishers to see what their policies were around sharing open access to COVID-19 articles. And so all of these over, over 100 publishers agreed for a limited amount of time to make their articles freely available, which they did. Um, but if you go through the spreadsheet now, they're all closed access again. They've closed them, closed access to them again, um, with the exception of JSTOR. <laughs> so um, it's, it's unfortunate that they have to be closed again, but it demonstrates in a way that this can be done if there, there is enough political will. So, I mean, COVID-19, I hope, has been a wake-up call and pushed open science to the foreground. As politicians, the public, the research community are now keenly aware of the importance of rapid and open sharing of research outputs. And this is really on um, something that's very visible at the moment. Um, uh, as Robert Jan Smits, who was the former Director General of Research and Innovation at the European Commission and one of the Plan S architects says, let's turn this abnormal situation in which COVID-19 relevant papers and data are shared widely into a normal situation. Or Vincent Laraviere, Professor at the University of Montreal says, now how you know, can, can we justify um, not making research on cancer or cardiovascular diseases freely accessible as well. So um, uh, myself and my um, uh, members of the core executive board um, also published a blog post related to this, um, you know, really urging the community not to go back to, to business as usual. So I think what we're seeing now are some glimmer of hope, some small signs of progress, some new growth in the forest. Um, and I think there, this is an opportunity to, to, to seed and try to work on regenerating the diversity of the scholarly ecosystem. And so I just like to talk about a couple of recent develop, developments in the policy arena that I think really show that perhaps, you know, the tide is turning a little bit. Um, the first is um, the draft open science, uh, UNESCO open science recommendations. Um, these were pu published last month. They, they mentioned bibliodiversity, the importance of equity, um, not for the, the, the role of not-for-profit infrastructures. Um, it's a very, very good document um, that culminated after a two-year process of regional and stakeholder con consultations, and then a very intensive three or four days of meetings with member states where they went through um, the text of these recommendations point by point. <laughs> and uh, Ginny was actually there representing Australia. It was, it was quite an uh, excruciating process, but um, it, it resulted with an, a very, very good document. And I think part of the reason was is that it was coming at a time after right in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd just like to read a very uh, brief quote um, from uh, Anna Persik, who's the Director of Science Policy and Partnerships at UNESCO. Um, uh, she was talking about this process and she said, I really think we have rarely seen an international normative instrument for where there was such a broad consensus and agreement among so many different countries. Over 100 countries participated in the meeting and the spirit of constructive diplomacy was just incredible. So um, uh, the, the recommendations are aimed at member states and um, they will be ratified at the UNESCO meeting in November, 2021. And I think it's very likely they will be ratified. I, I, well, I, um, I encourage you to go and, and read them. I think they're very good. 
Um, another thing that happened recently was at the G7 meeting, um, there was a G7 research compact, which was um, uh, uh, published and agreed upon by the G7 countries, which also talks about open access and the val removing barriers to open and rapid sharing of knowledge, data, and tools to the greatest extent possible. Um, uh, plan S is a plan mainly predominantly um, in, uh, supported by European countries, but increasingly some other countries. Um, and they have uh, more recently um, published a rights retention strategy where they require all um, researchers to retain the rights to their to the content that they produce so in their articles in particular, which I think again will really help lead to um, supporting bibliodiversity because researchers will have um, uh, uh, the freedom to be able to um, deposit those articles anywhere they, they like. So, um, the, you know, I think we are at a moment in time where um, there are a lot of possibilities and at core, we really believe that repositories are critical for supporting equity and diversity in, in open science. Um, and there, for a number of reasons, one in particular, they um, uh, enable the community to collect a variety of different content types. So we need to move away from this singular focus on journal articles and create a system, an ecosystem that allows us to um, preserve and provide access to any types of valuable research outputs, um, whether they're journal articles, data, protocols, lab notes, or whatever. Um, and the second thing I'd also like to point out is that um, they're distributed. They're a very high list, highly distributed network. They're housed and maintained mainly, mostly by long-lived universities and institutions. So there's a distribution of control by the community um, across a, 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 an international network, which will allow, you know, um, localized, supporting um, localized communities. So uh, what we'd like to do at CORE is really build on, on this momentum that we see <clears throat> um, culminating at the moment. Um, and I'd like to just point out two of the things that, that we're, we're going to be pushing very strongly now. Uh, the first is, um, is to try to modernize the global repository network. So one of our, shall we say, weaknesses or um, things that we're open to criticism about is that repositories you know, um, are using sometimes outdated software, they're understaffed, um, so they can't provide um, as, as good quality service as we would like them to do if we want them to take their place as major infrastructure components in, in scholarly communications. So we will be launching um, a strategy actually, it'll be tomorrow, <laughs> my, tomorrow morning, my time, this evening, your time and, and Ginny um, will actually be attending that. And so will, will Martin Borcher. Um, and the idea is really to work with national partners to try to develop some strategi, um, strategies to really strengthen repos repository net, um, networks at the national level. Um, so this is our meeting that will be happening later today, this evening, your time. And um, uh, again, what we would like to do really is address some of the issues that have come out around how we can really strengthen and catalyze repositories. So this was a, the results of, um, of a poll that I did during the Open Repositories Conference. And uh, we really just want to look at how we can address some of the challenges around running old software, underfunding of repository services, uh, institutional silos, lack of visibility, and so on. And the next thing we're working on, which we have been working on for several years, is really to look at how repositories can um, support the use 
um, the integration of value added services. <clears throat> so this came out of our vision around next generation repository, um, uh, the next generation repository initiative and another um, project that we had been working on called pub fair, where what we really, our, our vision really is around repositories as a, the foundational la layer with content, but on top of repositories collectively, we can build value added services. So we, at a, in a very high level um, in our pub fair paper, we kind of tried to uh, visualize what these, this might look like with again, repositories at the bottom, interoperable, and then this publishing layer of peer review services that interact with those repositories. And then um, some uh, dissemination channels, kind of Spotify-like dissemination channels. So I think the pub fair high level vision is very ambitious. And um, what we've started to work on is one piece of that, which is um, called the Notify project, which is focusing on the use case of connecting repository resources with peer review services. Um, and so uh, our goal with this project is really to enhance the role of repositories, to, to move them from being collecting content after the pub publication has happened to being an active player in the publication process. So this is um, uh, a model, supporting a model that we call publish then review which has, start, has started to become popularized during COVID-19, where we have a lot of uh, researchers depositing preprints, and then the peer review is happening after the article is available through a preprint repository. And we really think this kind of thing could um, really increase the value and uh, the, enhance the role of repositories. It can operate at scale. So any repositories that have adopted the technical and standards that we're proposing can participate in this model. And it's, it's a sustainable approach because it, again, relies on our institutions, um, our, collectively our long-lived universities. Um, so we launched this project in January. Um, we have some first phase implementers, uh, mainly in Europe with uh, several French um, organizations as well as a Portuguese organization that are starting to implement the technologies. So we've developed um, uh, some technologies and protocols, mainly using linked data notifications. I'll, I'll explain a little bit in a minute. And then we have a number of second phase implementers um, that we hope will be in implementing in the fall or early next year. And so the way this whole thing works is that we're not trying to integrate a peer review service into a repository. What we're doing, what we're proposing is that any repository that has an article in it can um, have an inbox and an outbox, and that will allow um, link data notifications to be sent out from the repository to a peer review service and then messages to go back. So as a scenario, we could say an author deposits an article into the Humanities Commons repository. The author would like to have their article peer reviewed. They click on um, you know, a, a request for peer review from a certain service and then a message would be taken across to that peer review and then the service would reply yes or no, they will review it or they won't review it. So th this is the kind of thing that we're proposing and have been in the process of developing and um, are, you can find all of the information about that on the Notify project website, on a web page on the core website. And we're very um, extremely <laughs> excited about the potential of this to transform scholarly communications. So um, in conclusion, I think, you know, in the midst of a crisis um, lies great opportunity. And I think now is the time. There is a, 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 a very real opportunity for us now to transform the scholarly communication system 
And so what we need to really do is work together at the global international level to do that. So thank you very much. And I welcome any questions or comments you have. Thanks very much, Kathleen. That's, um, that was a fantastic overview and uh, very empowering, actually. I, um, I think it's a sort of, uh, we often feel rather hopeless in the face of some of the changes that are happening. And I, I just think seeing the kind of work that, that CORE has been doing has been, uh, it's really quite transformative, actually. Um, so there's a, a few questions coming in and a few things that popped up that I wanted to um, mention, but I will just say one thing that came up in Twitter that was quite interesting is that uh, Hilda Bastin, is who many of you will know as a sort of uh, sort of a campaigner in this area, has noted that even access to clinical trials is now being locked down from of the COVID, the massive COVID trials, which I just find absolutely astonishing. We are definitely going backwards in a, in a way that's quite quite worrying. Um, okay, I'm going to go through some of the questions and apologies to everyone if we don't get to all of them, but I will do as I can. One thing I just wanted to um, ask about uh, first, which I think is a, a real issue that we all struggle with, is that there's a huge burden on researchers to understand the, the eco complex ecosystem, and in fact, it's getting more complex. Um, what do you think about how can that, um, how can we remove that burden from researchers somewhat and perhaps shift it onto the system or onto institutions more generally? Oh, uh, that's that's complicated. I mean, I think um, I, I do think libraries have an important role to play um, in terms of uh, facilitating and fostering this shift. Um, you know, staff library staff are one of our greatest resources, and I think one of the things that needs to happen in the future as we transition is we also transition our library staff towards playing a, a, a greater role in terms of supporting researchers in, and, you know, holding their hands and helping them uh, make the right choices. Um, but I guess the other issue really is, you know, um, policymakers, funders, research assessment, all of that, they, that really, in a way, um, guides uh, researchers in terms of what where they feel they should be going in terms of, of you know publishing their their work. So I, I think funders also have a role to play in terms of uh, making clear uh, clear um, policy statements around that, um, which you know I think we haven't had that as much lately. But Plan S is probably one of the, uh, you know, one of the organizations that is helping to play a leadership role in that area. Yeah, great, thank you. That's, I think that's exactly right. It's about changing the system, isn't it, rather than individuals having to change themselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a question now from Scott Abbott, and he said, um, uh, can you describe what you think the role of corporate publisher repository systems such as Explore Own, Pure, et cetera, are in, the, in a global repository system? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not, in, I'm not that in favor of them because I think what's happening, what's going to happen is is knowledge extraction, right? So, in in the beginning, we think it's it's innocent and they're just providing a service for us, but like we've seen with sort of Facebook or um, Google or uh, you know, these other large platforms, uh, I, I imagine, and I, I think there's growing amount of evidence that um, that the, the value that these kind of companies are getting from, from uh, hosting content is not just about um, us paying for their service, it's about the information that they're extracting from the use from the use of those uh, those user services that they are again repackaging and selling to others. So um, you know, I would uh, normally say you know the small guys, the small guys are okay. The big guys, you want to be wary of because again, they they have um, they're they're in the business of data extraction, so they're using user data. But the small guys, you know, don't have enough data to be able to do that. But now the small guys just 
often end up getting bought out by the big guys. <laughs> so, so you can't really trust, you know, that even a small commercial service provider will remain, you know, a small com commercial service provider for long. And we've seen, we've seen that, for example, with B press bought up by, by, um, by Elsevier. So I, I, my feeling is that it's better to, to use non-commercial platforms for content hosting, even if sometimes they are less functional than the commercial ones. Yeah, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Particularly when universities, I think now are sort of very much to opting to buy rather than build. And I think that we are yeah. in a, you know, it is a challenging time. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, so I'm just going to try and pick some ones that cover some major topics. One of them is around uh, some Tom, Tom Saunders, who's asked, what's your view on fund, fund or national level open access mandates? Are there any specific points you think ought to be carefully considered as they're being formulated, in particular in relation to green or repository based routes? Yeah, no, I think um, funder mandates are critical to to advance open science. We really need to have uh, funder requirements. Um, uh, green, and I also believe that green must be an aspect of those funder mandates because there are there's a significant portion of researchers around the world that can't pay APCs. So if the funder mandate requires open ac publishing in an open access journal, um, yeah, uh, then we create this system that relies on, on APCs and um, that's just uh, excluding, excluding many, many uh, researchers around the world. So um, I think green is a very important aspect of um, any funder should be should be critical and included in any funder mandate, and I also think that you know this this is also about um, creating an ecosystem. So we really want to nurture repositories because we know that repositories are going to be the vehicles that support open access to data, open access to all this other type of content. So um, as we, if we exclude them, you know, in the funder mandates around articles, we're just losing an opportunity to start building and investing in that infrastructure that we know we will need down the line as we advance open science. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. I'm, I'm gonna bundle a few questions together because I think there are sort of similar themes. So one is around, I think quite a lot of um, uh, institutions and we've also seen some uh, groups get very concerned about we should focus on the version of record and I think some of that is tied to the fact that we don't have the necessary infrastructure to link everything together so I'm just wondering if you could comment on on that and um, what your views are on, on that, that, that sort of approach yeah the version <laughs> the version of record so again I think what what we have where we're moving now in terms of our our vision at core is really that um, we should allow for many versions of, of articles. And what is most important is that there's a rec so rather than a version of record, it's it's the the record of the different versions. So like you might see, I think it's F1000 or whatever, you're you can you can just acknowledge that this is a version, this is another version. Um, you know, or a more advanced or, or a later version of something that was published earlier. And it, it, that I think more appropriately represents the reality of how our knowledge is, is developed over time. Um, and, you know, the version of record is really something that's, that's something that is very, uh, is promoted by the publishers because, of course, that's really what they—that—that's really what their value is. But, but, but I think we're starting to see that. Um, well, first of all, that there's not that much difference between a preprint and the the published version. So the whole this whole idea that the version of record is the only version that can be trusted is is not really true. Um, but also, you know, as we move towards models where there's open peer review and 
um, based on uh, new reviews, articles evolve over time, um, that, that it's becoming a kind of an outdated or obsolete um, concept, I think. I love that concept. Instead of a version of record, the record of version, that's uh, you should trademark that if you haven't talked about it. That's exactly right, I think. I um, can't take credit for it, but uh, okay. well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way of thinking about things. So thanks for that. Um, I'll just we're almost at time. I'll just I want to cut, come to a couple of things. One is that just a note from somebody has is that there is a real challenge with searching repositories. And I think that's that's true, particularly. Um, and I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on how that is moving forward at, at the moment. Um, and then there's another question that I'll just perhaps might almost end on it, which is that, you know, we should be, obviously, what about open source projects that are um, supporting infrastructure? Is, is, are there areas perhaps where you'd like to see particular investment or um, either time or resources? Yeah, I mean, the discovery issue with repositories, I think uh, it's true and I, I have had regular conversations with Google Scholar, for example, to, to discuss that. I mean, I, I, in, in general, I think we need to, what we need is to spend more energy and resources in curating the metadata in our repositories so that, the, that we have higher quality, quality metadata and it's more comprehensive. Um, and it, the you know and the repositories are indexable by the major indexing services like google scholar or other services like open air so this is i i do think it is an issue um and but most of the i think most of the reason is that we're understaffed in our repositories and we don't you, you know, we don't use our staff to curate and, and make sure that the metadata is high enough quality so that it's, it can be discovered properly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your second point about open source, um, you know, again, this is really about under resourced, um, you know, I, I completely support open source projects, I think it's absolutely the way to go. But I do think that there, you know, again, there, there's some issues of resourcing in terms of, of our open source communities and being able to maintain and keep technologies up to date with as, as you know, as, as our technologies evolve. So I, all of this could be solved if we take some of that money that we're giving to Elsevier and the large publishers and move it towards, you know, and redirect it towards um, some of these types of project like discovery, you know, like um, curating content in our repositories or like um, supporting the open source communities that we rely upon. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Obviously, I completely agree with that. Um, look, I'm sorry to everybody if we didn't get to your questions. There were more coming in. Um, I think that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise and very inspiring for all of us here. Um, I'm looking forward to the call later tonight to continue the conversation with the repositories. And I know that there's a, a lot of interest from this region. So um, thanks very much again, Kathleen. And um, thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, keep in touch. We'll be doing another webinar in about a month's time. We'll be sending out uh, information on that shortly. So thanks to everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me, everybody.